And three, two, we are live. Jack Nichols, we are live. How are we doing today, Fletcher? Look at that. First episode. First episode today, January 2nd. New Year's. Post New Year's. Post New Year's. We're ready to go. This is a new year, fresh start. I love it. I love it. New podcast, new start. So I'll get right into it. This is the No One Told Me Hockey Podcast with myself, Jack Nichols, and my boy Fletcher Feynman over there on the other side. I'm just going to give a quick intro since this is episode one um, of the podcast. So the way we got the start on this podcast was I just finished school kind of out of hockey and I was looking kind of to stay in hockey, but not necessarily be on the ice or anything. So I started a TikTok account called Hockey Aid, where I kind of shared my story, gave advice to younger hockey players and stuff like that. And from there, I was getting a lot of great questions from youth, mainly youth players, some junior hockey players. Um, and me and Fletcher have been good friends for a long time. So I started telling him about my ideas and stuff. And we eventually came to the idea that since we are so knowledgeable in hockey and we are such good friends and get along really well, that we should start sharing our stories and stuff together. And the best way that we figured that we could do that is start a podcast. So here we are today with episode one of the No One Told Me podcast. Fletcher, introduce yourself. Where are you from? What are you doing now? Where'd you play? What's going on, everybody? Like Jack said, the No One Told Me hockey podcast. I'm loving it. Uh, it's New Year's, like Jack said, new start and something nice. And you know what? Even if nobody listens to this, it's kind of fun to talk. It um, is. Everybody loves hearing themselves, especially me a little bit. So <laughs> <laughs> it's honestly, it's nice to... Uh, chat with you obviously we've been friends for a long time mm-hmm. get into how we met um but about a little bit about me i'm from south florida i'm from lake worth I grew up playing there uh, when i was 16 15 i moved away from home mm-hmm. played for omaha u16 in the midwest in jack's territory yep. a little bit more of a hockey hotbed than south florida and from there i went to springfield junior blues in the north american hockey league where i played two years um one and a quarter with jack and then I was off to Union College, where I was a member of the Union College Dutchman for four years, um, played there for four years. And then by my spring, had a little injury issue. My senior spring, I, I also wanted to get into coaching. So now I'm working as a graduate assistant coach. So kind of on the other side of things. Um, it's kind of crazy when you get to that senior age, you try to start to kind of figure out where you're headed next. Right. Um, some guys in my class started working. Some of them are still playing. Um Jack is working. Right? Yeah, you are, I am. You're working. I am a full-time engineer now, so I'll give a little background to myself too as well. So I grew up in the Chicago area, just um, in the west suburbs. I mainly played double-A my whole career until I made the jump to triple-A in U16. Um, and then from there, I played in the North American Hockey League for four years. I could have gotten a degree in it. And uh, I had a little bit more of a bumpy road than my guy over here, Fletcher. I played for uh, quite a few teams, um, but it was a good learning experience. And then from there, I went to college where I went to Milwaukee School of Engineering, where I played hockey there and eventually became the captain. And at the end of it, I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering, where I now currently work as a full-time engineer out in Utah. So it's Jeez. been it's been quite the ride. Um, experienced a lot during that time, but um, I'm glad to be here and doing what I'm doing now. No, it's impre- it's impressive. I balancing athletics and hockey at the same time, or any sport necessarily, yeah. whatever sport, whether it's Division One, Division Three, it's club. It's not an easy thing to do. So to graduate with a mechanical engineering degree <laughs> from the Milwaukee School of Engineering, the Harvard of Milwaukee, <laughs> that's what they're saying. That's, that's what, what I've they- heard. That's what I've heard. It's not an easy thing to do. No, no, that's what they like to claim themselves as, as is the best in the Midwest. But uh, I love that. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I'll take it. So why don't you start off with giving us a little intro on how we met the yeah. first time we met and how we got to this point. So like Jack said, we've been friends for a real long time. Um, going back, probably my first year in Springfield, I think was 2016, uh, 16th. No, it was actually 2015. No, 15. It was 15, 16, 16, 17. I went to college, 17, 18. Are you sure? No, 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 no. no. no, no. Yeah, yeah. You're right, you're right, right. I went to college 18, 19. So, yes, yes, it was 16, 17. So, I was with Jack that first year. So, Jack and did My third year. My third year. So, Jack's (laughs) (laughs) Jack's third year in the league. My first year in the league. Um, We were on a team. We were struggling a little bit. Coach said he was bringing in a D. 
I was a little nervous. Obviously, I was a D2, but mm-hmm. something you got to deal with as you move up in levels. Right. Um, no one's ever safe. So this mm-hmm. guy comes in. Jack shows up wearing a bright chrome cage, <laughs> like something out of NHL 23 build a pro. That's what it looked like. So this guy shows up with a chrome cage. I'm like, who is this? The next thing I know, he's flying up and down the ice. Uh, we ended up being D partners the rest of the right. year, which was great. We lived real close to each other. Mm-hmm. Practically um, live with each other towards yeah. the end of the year. We would, I mean, dinners together, uh, basketball together, we played a ton of basketball. A lot of UFC, a lot, a lot of, UFC lot of fighting. I could yeah. still beat him to this day in <laughs> every video game known to man. <laughs> so, false. That's false. Um, yeah. So do you think we got like where we became friends was probably like on the basketball court? I would say, right? I, I would say realistically, you look at like any sort of team event outside of hockey because we're so competitive. Right. Uh, the sport itself is very competitive, mm-hmm. whether it be basketball, whether it be team functions, uh, parties to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I, those three on three basketball games that we played at the YMCA yeah. with uh, it, probably more intense than some of our practices and games. Oh, 100 percent. I remember like I still to this day remember like going to the Y like almost every single night. Yeah. And playing, a, whether it was like one-on-one or like we played like 21 or whatever it was, or if we had enough guys for three-on-three, three, yeah. like it probably wasn't, we, we kept it within a good range, but we definitely at times were picking up the pace and <laughs> pushing it I, a little bit. I want to say that there were certain times throughout those two years, especially throughout the year and a quarter or so that we were together, mm-hmm. where I think I got into full screaming matches with teammates. Oh, over. yeah. Oh, yeah. Over guys not either playing D enough D or or not passing offensively. The, the game's got intense. I was getting like shooting reps outside of us playing games. I'd go to the Y and like get my shots up. So when we played yeah. basketball, I was like ready. I love I was it. training for two sports at one time. I love it. So that's how we that's how we met uh mm-hmm. Springfield Junior Blues, North American Hockey League. Um and then that second year, right. little injury trouble, a couple bad bounces, Jack ends up getting cut slash traded essentially right yeah so i got i pretty much got cut um and then from there i went out and played in the u.s the ncdc just started that year um so i felt like that could be a good league outside of the na at that point um and one of our actually one of our um i'll just say people that fletcher and i both know vince he helped me get to the junior bruins that year so i ended up playing finishing the year with junior bruins which i think was it was a good move. I liked living out there and I had a lot of fun and we won a lot of games, which was a good, it was a nice change of pace. Um, yeah. So I ended up doing that and it was a good experience. I'm glad I went out to the East coast for a, a three quarters of a year, got a feel for it. Cause I think honestly, if I didn't go to school out there or if I didn't play juniors out there, I probably would have went to school out there instead yeah. of moving back to the Midwest. No, that's so, totally fair. Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad I, I got out there and experienced it for like a, three quarters of a year and then i was ready to move back to the midwest and like maybe live a little bit closer to home and go to school closer to home yeah so absolutely. it all works out it all works Abs- out absolutely shout out vince what a guy bloodline hockey on instagram bloodline hockey on twitter evolving athlete on twitter too great guy if any- great guy he's a good guy to work with um he knows a lot about hockey and the mental game and stuff like that um yeah so all right so let's get into a little hockey talk here then um so on this podcast, we mainly are going to cover college hockey, junior hockey, and youth hockey, just because that is what we are so um, experienced with. We've played at all three levels now, and we have a lot of knowledge in that area, um, a lot of experience combined between us. So we like to talk about that stuff. We could probably talk about it all day if we wanted to. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So I'm going to pose a question here for you. What do you think the biggest difference is, is between the USHL which is tier one, and then the NAL and the NCDC, which is tier two in the United States? Yeah, so I would probably answer this in two separate parts. So I'm going to look at it individually, I think. We could look at it together like that, and then we could look at it from a player stand, like a content standpoint, like what's in each league. Right. Um, from what's in each league, I'm going to probably argue that the USHL is a younger, more skilled, high-paced league. 100%. So if you're an older late bloomer, right, that may not be the league for you right out of youth hockey. Right, right. It may take a, it may take a couple of years to get there, and they have a age limit rule too. Yes. So that automatically puts a cap on the amount of guys that are aging out that year. 
I think they can only have four yep. on the roster. Yep. So that automatically makes it a younger league right off the start. Absolutely. And then from, <clears throat> and then we look at the North American League is a little bit older, a little bit mm-hmm. older. It's got some division one commits, right? More and more as the years go on. There's so yeah. many good hockey players out there. Right. Um, a lot of D3 as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you, the stigma around the difference between division one and division three hockey is large in the hockey community, but right. now coaching at division three and having experienced division one, the difference is very slim, uh, very slim. So it shows how good that league is. NCDC, some guys, out, it's more so out East. It is primarily out East. Right. Um, a lot of players will stay close to home. Some division one players, division three uh-huh. players as well. Right. Um, so like Jack said, tier one, tier two, D three from an individual standpoint, I would say that the USHL difference, North American League and NCDC, is the two things that you see at every level that are different from each other, skating and passing. Yeah, I, 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 totally, think, that's I, I think. totally agree. Like if you skate, like if you go out and skate with a USHL guy and an all guy, like you can tell if they're wearing the same gear, you could tell, I think, which one played in which league based off of those two things. I would Yeah, think. I think every level, it's every level you talk about. Uh, professional differences, whether it be yeah. NHL, AHL, and Coast, uh, it's passing, right? right? Guys at the NHL level aren't necessarily missing passes in practice. Yeah. And it goes down and down as you go down, and the difference is very slim, right? But it's a noticeable thing. So I would right. say the pass. Now, now, how would you, if you're somebody, right, and you're a youth hockey player, right, you hear this, right, passing, how do I get my passing better? What do you think? Hmm. That's interesting because passing, I I almost feel like passing to some players is just a really natural thing, right? They kind of have that vision for it. They have the feel for it. You know, they, they see those like, you know, like under a stick, like the triangle and stuff, they can see those kind of lanes in between, um, you know, players and stuff on how to get the puck to specific guys. But I think like the one way that you can really become a good passer or you know being an effective passer is keeping keeping your passes simple yeah. because at the end of the day like you don't need to find all these difficult passes to try to make through a bunch of different guys and stuff right at the end yeah. of the day keep your passes simple and then maybe from there as you make these um, simple passes and stuff you can build confidence to try di- you know other types of passes and like get a little bit more creative with them but i think at the beginning, you really have to focus on just making even like those simple, like six foot passes. Yep. Guys mess up on all the time. Like they'll put it in guys' skates and they're only like eight feet away from them. Like yep. you you have to be able to make those simple ones first, I think, before you can start building. One of my one of my favorite jokes that I had heard in college, right? My my coach was a huge fan of Nick Lindstrom. And mm-hmm. Nick Lindstrom was the king of the five foot pass. Right. Like this guy's outlets were simple and effective in five foot, but Nick Lindstrom. And this was the joke, right? It's not true. Nick Lindstrom, <laughs> my coach used to say, had a twin brother. And his twin brother's name was Franz Lindstrom. But oh, nobody, wow. but nobody oh, ever boy. heard nobody <laughs> ever heard of Franz because because Franz used to complicate the game. Right. Franz, so there's Franz and Nick Lindstrom. Nobody ever heard of Franz because he right. didn't simplify the game. The five foot pass, like Jack said, it's so important. Right. No, oh, that's actually unreal story. Franz, <laughs> Franz Lindstrom. He never, he never made it anywhere because he was trying to overcomplicate the game. Yeah, and I and honestly I, think that happens to a lot of guys, right? They feel like you have to do all these like crazy things to stand out. Yep. And it's, it's almost the other way around. It's how consistently can you do the simple things? Oh yeah. And in right. video the next, if you made a complicated pass in a game and video the next day, the oh. caption, the caption and the caption would be, Franz Lindstrom. No it would way. Be, it no would just be way. somebody trying to make a stretch pass through four people. <laughs> right. Picked off going the other way. Waist high sauce, like through three guys on the power play. Just yep. pick it off. Franz Franz, Franz Lindstrom. Lindstrom. Don't be so so kids out there, bottom line, let's not be Franz Lindstrom when it comes to passing. But when it comes to skating, right? Now we yeah. talk about skating, right? Skating differences. In the USHL, North American League, NCDC. Now, look, there's Division One commits in all the leagues. Mm-hmm. We are we are looking at right slim differences on the averages, right? Slim right. differences on the averages. I would say the skating in the USHL is better than the North American League, which is better than the NCDC, which is better than the EHL, right? And it goes down right. and down and down. Right. What about the skating? Do you think is a clear difference when you look at it? 
I think in terms of like, like, cause obviously like you'll skate with USHL guys and stuff. Or when we were younger, we skated yep. with the USHL guys and stuff. I, for some reason, like it, especially the forwards, I notice it like the forwards yep. in the USHL just seem to be like super shifty. Yes. Like they seem so, so solid on their edges and stuff. So I, I really do think it comes down to like how strong they are on their edges. Cause that allows yes. you to do a, when you, when you have good edges and stuff, it allows you to do so much more with your skating, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, because oh, yeah. I know for you, like I remember when we were playing in uh, junior blues together, you you had really good edges. You could do some like crazy like edge work drills because you went to, I believe this is from like going to PV and stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that yeah. right? So yeah. like, and you became like a really good skater based off your edges and how you're able to control them. Yeah. No, I'd say one of my... Uh, shout out i go we already gave our shout out to vince i would give a huge shout out to paul vincent hockey development it is one of the if not the largest hockey camp in massachusetts area um i happen to work mm-hmm. there so if you want to sign up come join but regardless of that i would say one of the things that pv has taught us who's an amazing person amazing mentor uh he won a stanley cup with the blackhawks college championship with rpi prep championship mm-hmm. with cushing one of his biggest principles is skating and edge work Mm-hmm. Right. If you can't skate, you can't play the game. And I think right. that that is so overlooked. Now, it's not that you only skate, mm-hmm. right? It's not that you should be renting ice every day and only skating. Right. But, but 10, 20 minutes, right? That, that foundational work can't be overlooked. Yeah. And that's, fa- that's, fa- that's whether it's foot recovery, whether it's arm swing, whether it's learning how to be on the inside, learning how to be on your outside, getting comfortable in the flats of your blades, mm-hmm. becoming shifty. Right. That is so important for a youth hockey player. I I can't stress it enough. Well, and I think also like besides like just focusing like on on ice stuff too, like you can do stuff off ice too, right? Like getting your core. So I'll call the core above your kneecap and below your chest is your core. And I think getting that area stronger because that controls most of your body and how you move within that area. So building that strength in that area so you can control your body. So when you do make these stops or tight turns and stuff like that your upper half like isn't lagging your yeah. lower half and you just have way more control over your your body motions and i think that re- that really helped me when i was um growing up and kind of moving my way up from like double a to triple a was i yeah. started working out in the gym and it allowed me to transfer that onto the ice like on ice strength and that yep. totally helped my skating like yeah. tenfold like over not overnight because it took a lot of work but like you know, once I built that strength, it was night and day on my skating. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's not, it's not like you said, working out right at a young age, it's working out the right way, right? right? You could build a good core, right? You can get in great shape, but if you're 14 years old and you're bench pressing 335, it's not, I don't, we don't need that. It's no. not necessary. No, it's that, not necessary. That, that, that is one thing like I, cause I make those videos and stuff and kids ask me how they can get stronger and stuff. Yeah. And one thing I always try to say is don't focus on like repping out as heavy as you can, because that's yeah. not how the game is played. Right. Everything is very quick and explosive. So I re- like for me, what worked for me and stuff, too, is going to a lighter weight and descending slow and then exploding out of that, out of those lifts and stuff. So m- m- focus on lighter weight, more explosive than, you know, some people just want to focus on how much they can lift. Yeah, Absolutely. But at the Absolutely. end of the day, I don't think that is as effective in building, you know, hockey strength. No, I agree 100%. And, and I would say the huge, uh, and this may top any sort of strength exercise outside of the core. I would mm-hmm. say if you're a young age, right, you're starting to get a little bit more serious about hockey. I would stress conditioning off mm-hmm. the ice, right, getting yourself in the best shape possible. Yep. Now, that doesn't mean you're not allowed to eat cake. or That doesn't mean you're not allowed to eat pizza. It has nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. right but it's doing everything in moderation right and mm-hmm. it's taking pride right maybe i do go for a run right maybe i learn how to jump rope maybe i play some basketball right some soccer yeah. some other yeah. sports on the side that can only make you a better player can only help i think i think that like in terms because like i feel like you can get burnt out by just doing one thing like if you're solely oh, yeah. focused on hockey especially at that age like and you're taking it that seriously i feel like you need you need that change of pace you need to play other sports you need to do follow your other interests outside of just hockey i think it's so much so good for like your mental health in terms of like not burning out with with hockey yeah 100 percent. now you're gonna now we're starting to get into this right youth development a little bit we want to talk about that that, that change from youth hockey to juniors yeah. from juniors to college 
Now, you're probably going to answer this in two parts, right? Because there's tons of different players, but mm -hmm. you got the really high end player, right? right? And then you got the medium player and you got the low player, right? They have a little bit, a little bit harder time. How do I make it to juniors? Okay. So as a, as a middle of the pack guy, like playing AAA middle of the pack, right? It's kind of what I'll focus on right here because this is kind of something I went through myself as a personal experience. Yeah. I would like when I was growing up, I played AAA, um, U16s and I was probably like a, a fit. I actually played forward Andy that year, yeah. which was actually a lot of fun. I loved yeah. it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I was, I was right around like a fifth D, like nothing special and stuff. But I, in that, after that season, I was, I was, this was like my most dedicated and I was getting, I was getting really good, really good skater, really good puck handler and stuff. So I put in the work too. It's not like it just happened, yeah. but what I did at the end of the season in the spring is I, I went down the list of all the NA teams and I found, I found teams that were losing about say three to five defensemen. Yeah. I, you know, I wrote down all the coaches emails, which are super easy to find on their websites usually. And I drafted an email and I sent it out to, the coaches that I identified that I thought would be a good fit where I thought I could be a good fit. Yeah. Now I, I also adjusted the email so it looked organic and it wasn't just yeah. copy and paste each coach. Cause they do talk and who knows how something could get brought up or whatever. Yeah. And out of those emails, I only got one email reply back. And from there I was able to open the communication up with them, schedule a phone call with them. I went to their tryout camp and we had this relationship built and I ended up making an NA team based off of reaching out to a coach by email. So I think yeah. if you're going to be kind of that mid tier player in AAA, cause it, it, it's tough to be those top top tier guys. There's only a few of them. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys right in that middle of the pack type player. I think you, you have to be an advocate for yourself. You have to, you have to go out and reach out to these coaches yourself. You can't expect them to come and find you you have yeah. to be proactive and take action do you agree yeah i would say absolutely i would say that one of the best advice i ever heard for yourself that i ever heard for myself right throughout college and throughout juniors i probably even learned it a little bit in u16 i had a great coach who was hard right we'll talk about mm -hmm. that at some point but he instilled a ton of lessons to me and he used to say right you're your best advocate also for my parents right they're big on this you're right. your best advocate but it's advocating yourself advocating for yourself in the right way yep right like I, don't go blowing up coaches emails during game seven of their playoff series and you're shooting them three emails in one night it's not right. that's not necessary no but right in that summertime right post their season not right away maybe after a little bit um when they're looking right looking for their rosters what are they graduating how many guys are leaving their program how many guys are potentially coming in you could find that information someplace right depending on draft data and everything yeah, yeah. and really looking into right what may be a good place for me and it's not only advocating for yourself when you're trying to find a team but when you're on a team you need to have an open line of communication with your coach and it's right. not a, it's not an open line of communication in terms of my opinions on other players it's an open yeah, line of yeah. communication in terms of how can i get better right so I, and i huge. think a lot of, i think a lot of players i mean i went through it myself too like you're so nervous of what the coach is thinking that you're almost like scared to talk to him because you don't want to like offend him or say the wrong thing to him or you yeah. know, give him a bad impression and something so you definitely like you just said you have to be like because they they're you know coaches have emotions too they have opinions yeah. and stuff so it's like you 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 have to be natural and you know be yourself because I, I i don't like when people are i are fake or whatever i think it's important to be yourself and who you are yeah. but then depending on who you are you need to be able to adjust it to be able to you know I don't know, not, not offend him, but like handle the conversation the correct way. Yeah. Right. Cause that, I think that is having those um, conversations with coaches and stuff can go a really long way. I think, and, I think it's so important, even if it's instilling those lessons at the youth level. And I remember one of the first times I had to do this, you're going to, I don't, Jack, I don't think you know the story. Mm -hmm. I was a, I was a squirt. Oh, right. Shit. I was on the Florida Alliance. I was so young. Oh my and God. I lied to my parents. I don't know what I lied over. I think it was calling my grandfather. I lied to them. I told them I did. I didn't. They found <laughs> out. I think they found out just by checking the phone thing. Right. Like you could just Simple. check who called. So yeah. It's some dumb error. My dad made me go to the coach, right? And tell the coach what I did. And my punishment, which I think was a coach times parent decision. 
Right. Was, right. Was I, love had to, I love yeah. it already. I love was, it already. <laughs> my punishment was I had to dress in my gear and watch practice from the bench. So now everybody, and I'm talking the whole team, is like, what is Fletcher doing in the box? Now You're in the box? They put you no, in the no, box? No, 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 the no, like the bench, the bench, the bench. I feel like they should have put you in the box, though. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would have been better the box. The box would have been great. But what the, what the lesson told me, right, I look back at it now, is one, obviously, don't lie to your parents. Right. Two, right, is you you got to be able to have the trust in your coach, right? You can communicate with things that aren't just hockey. Yeah, right? I made a yeah. mistake that a coach is going to teach you a life lesson and hold you accountable, right? Those are mm-hmm. so important. Well, so for me, like there was a couple times in juniors when like I was struggling because I, I I'll get into it at, at another date, but like yeah. I didn't I two years in a row, my last two years, I felt I should have been a captain, and I I still to this day believe based on who was picked in, not the captain, like an assistant yeah. or captain, regardless, yeah, assistant, I would say, I still to this day believe I was in the position to be one, yeah, and. I didn't get it and it mentally threw me off for yeah, for the whole yeah. time I was there. Two years in a row, I got traded or cut within like the first month and a half, two months because of mentally I was struggling because because of that. Yeah. No, and that, so that's... I, I wish I wish looking back now I would have like gone to the coach and told him that and like let him know this is why, you yeah. know, why I'm struggling and stuff like that. And like it's it's okay to be like talk about like your mental side of things too with them outside yeah. of just hockey oh yeah 100 percent. and you think and now that i'm on the other side of it right i'm getting a little bit more of right what is going on in the coach's room like what are we talking about what what right. is being said and as a player and i experience this so much as a player is you're always thinking me 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 not mm-hmm. in a bad not in a bad way right. but necessarily like Oh my God, I just messed up a rep. I'm now thinking about that rep for the next 30 minutes. Now yeah. after after practice, I'm like, man. You're thinking about it till the next day almost yeah, sometimes. Yeah. After practice, you're like, man, coach yeah. is still thinking about this. To be honest, right? The coach likely in a drill is looking at the big picture. Sure, they see the bobbled pass, but at the end of the practice, now they're analyzing the drill, right? How did that run? It's not right, right. It, it, for the most part, it's not, man, what was what was Fletcher doing today? For the most part, it's not that. Right. It's more so, right? You're just a piece of the puzzle. And yeah. the quicker you can learn that as a player and be the best and most effective piece as, po- piece as possible, mm-hmm. right? The quicker and better hockey player you're going to become, you're going to move up those chains that level better. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think the only, I think the only time it becomes a problem with like coaches and stuff is if it's like the same player on a consistent basis, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if the yeah. same player can't, can't figure out how to you know do a drill or like it seems to always be messing it up i think that's when it becomes a problem maybe yeah. but overall like if you mess up whatever once yeah. in a once in a blue moon like it's it's nothing it's, yeah you know coaches have way too much going on absolutely so we talk about so we would just recap a little bit and we got on that right. tangent right always. we talk about it's easy to it's easy to and it's not going to be the last time so we no. look at it as like Right. How can I make juniors? We talk about advocating for yourself. The only thing that I would add, I would add to that, and it's advocating for yourself at the right time. Mm-hmm. And right, it's not going to be the same for everybody. Right, the the number one center, the number one winger, the top two D. Right, junior teams may be coming to you at the youth level. Right, yeah. you may, you may yeah. get that early draft. I know that WHL has a bantam draft for Western That's listeners. Crazy. That's right? so crazy. It is the USHL. Right, you're 15. The OHL, you're 15. You're young. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of the time for the late bloomer, right? You got to be self-aware of that, right? Don't get don't get down because you weren't drafted in the USHL, right? Don't get mm-hmm. down because you weren't drafted in the North American League, right? There's so many players. And once you get to college or once you get to wherever you're yeah. going after juniors, right? No one's going to care where you came from. No. At all. That, no, like when you're in like a college locker room and stuff, no one, no one brings up like how many points they had in juniors. Really where, the, no. I mean, you know where everyone played for the most part. Yeah. But it's not like because you probably asked them or yeah. like you found out whatever, looking them up or something. Not that they went and out of their way to let you know where they played and how good they were and stuff. It's not like that in college. It's more of like a like a team camaraderie there because, yeah. you know, it's just different in college. Like you're there for four years. You know, you're not maybe you have the fear of getting cut at the beginning. But like for the most part, you can't get traded in college. 
So it's like you kind of have that security in college a little bit, and it kind of yeah. becomes more of a team team game, I think, than juniors. And like you said, so everyone's kind of there and on on the same page that we don't care where you played or whatever. We we're all here in the same spot now. Yeah, I think that one. Uh, you, I love what you said there, right? You get that team camaraderie and atmosphere in college, not so much in juniors. Mm-hmm. But I think, right? You look at junior teams that win it all, right? If you, yeah. I, I'd argue that if you look at the winner of the USHL and you look at the winner of the BC, the NA, and the NCDC, right? Whoever's winning that tournament, I commend that coach and that organization a ton for building that winning culture. Right. I think building that winning culture has to be so tough to do with so many different personalities and stuff. It like has yeah. to fit almost perfect. There might be one or two guys who don't necessarily fit that puzzle, but if you have 20 other guys, that are they kind of drown that out a little bit you know what i mean yeah like, yeah because i i would i would say that like right if you're a committed player and and when i say committed i'm referencing probably these are for younger listeners right somebody who's either gotten a college scholarship or a college agreement to they, that's where you're going and you lose a game in junior right likely you're probably thinking man like how, how does that look to them or how did i play yeah. were they there watching versus right. Like, what did we do wrong as a team, right? That's not an yeah. easy message to get across to 18 and 19 year olds. No, especially when like you, you got a bunch of kids trying to all fight for the same scholarships. Yes, absolutely. Right. Like they, a lot of them are, most of them, I would say are focused on themselves and their performance and their plus minus and their points that night yeah. versus the team win. And that's one thing I noticed, like, like you just said, like the, the culture, the winning culture and stuff the teams that I played on that were successful, like guys didn't, didn't really care about their points as much as they did winning. Cause I think guys were in the understanding that if we win games, scouts are going to come to our games and they're going to look at even third line guys out there. If you're on a really good winning team. Oh yeah. Cause usually the first and second line guys are probably already committed by then. If you're on a good team like that. So now they're on to looking at third line guys on that team because you're winning hockey games. And I think a lot of kids don't realize that if you win games, more scouts are going to come. If you lose games, no scouts are going to come to your games. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I think that that's what that's seen in juniors a ton with college scouts. I would say that's seen even more so, right? If you look at youth programs and what scouts are going to a youth programs game, they're going like junior teams are going to watch that top 15, that top 20 right? The mission versus little Caesars, right? Right. That's Chicago mission. And yeah, the Detroit honey bake versus bell yeah. tire. Right. And it's getting, it, I don't want to say that you have to be on those teams. It's not, mm-hmm. that's not the message. No. Right. The message no. is if you can find a spot on those teams where you are playing and in a spot to succeed, right. That is so important. I think that kind of goes into the next, right. What I was going to get to next, right. Is I want to ask Jack, right what age do you think and we'll probably both touch on it is a good time to go to juniors right i i really think it's player dependent and junior league dependent yeah right like if you're a u16 player and you try out for your tier two team and you don't make it i would not because you know juniors is getting younger and younger each year it seems like guys are in like such a rush to get the juniors now yeah if you don't make a tier two team, don't feel like you need to be in a rush. Don't just go to a tier three team just because yeah. you feel like you have to play juniors. I think yes. you're better off playing at the U16. Le- you're going to get more looks at the U16 level Absolutely. Versus, tier- versus tier three, no doubt. And you're better off staying at U16 and playing another year or two developing. So in- to answer the question, though, I really think it's better. It's really player dependent. And I think it depends on kind of what your role is on the team. If it were me and I could go back to playing U16 and then going to juniors, I would honestly have would have stayed another year in AAA and learned how to play top line minutes. Because I think that next year I would have been in a situation to be on the power play, be on the penalty kill, play in the last minute of the game and learn how to be in those situations. So when you do go to juniors and maybe not the first year, maybe you're on the third line the first year, you got to put in your work, put in your time. But maybe that following year, now you're in those positions and you're you're ready for them, right? Because I remember yeah. I got put in those positions in juniors and I never played in those type of type of uh, scenarios. And it was like I was learning it in juniors and making mistakes in juniors. Well, you know, scouts and stuff were there for college and stuff where yeah. I think you're better off learning all that stuff in AAA. 
Yes. I would say I would, that that youth time period, right? And I'm talking like the high level youth, like U16 AAA, U18 AAA, depending mm-hmm. on the program, right? There's mm-hmm. some great programs out there of U18 AAA. Shattuck St. Mary does a great job. Mount St. Yep. Charles does a great job, right? Mid Fairfield does a great job. Like so many good teams. So many. And the rush to get to juniors, right? The appeal, right? I'm going to go play on this junior team or that junior team is, is intense, right? And every yeah. and, and you get the high level players going so early, get the national program taking guys early, right? It, it's an mm-hmm. easy thing to get caught up in, but taking right. the time in youth hockey to kind of learn what type of player you are, right? Mm-hmm. Am I a stay at home D? Am I a two way D? Am I an offensive D? You know, what, what type of player I am? Because at the next level, and, and I think this is, this is going to be a important thing to realize is everybody's good. Whether you're mm-hmm. making the jump from youth to juniors or juniors to college, yep. everybody's good, but you got to realize, right? What do I do? Great. Right. Right. Because that's, what's going to set you aside. Right. If you look at, I don't say, look at the guys at pro, right. Everybody can defend, right. Yep. For the most part, mm-hmm. but what, do, what does this defenseman do really, really well? Does he box guys out really, really well? Does yeah. he join the rush really, really well? And it's the same thing at, at, at youth, right? Or in the junior level, right? What do you do great, right? A lot of people say, you know, notice your positives, work on your negatives. I would say, and, and this is something that Vince had kind of talked to us a long time ago, mm-hmm. sorry, recognize your negatives, but make those positives the best thing in the world. Right, right. Because if you can hammer in on those and, you, you know, a team has to have all those different aspects on it to be a winning team, right? You have to have all different types of players. You can't have... 20 goal scores on the night yeah. on the ice every night you guys would lose or you guys would be in 13 to 12 games every night because you guys would be scoring a bunch but the other yeah. team would be scoring a bunch too because you don't play defense yeah so it's like uh, teams need all those pieces of the puzzle so i feel like nowadays with like social media and watching all these like really good young stars like like a zegers and stuff every yeah. player wants to be like that but if you can find almost like a niche like a you know like a a player niche like a profile yeah and you can own that and do really well at that i think you can have a successful career in moving up in the ranks and stuff i think there's opportunity for like every type of player a hundred percent and you talk about right learning what type of player you are right i think one of the things that i love i love doing still and i think that helped me a ton right watch hockey yeah. Like watch guys, right? And don't just watch and, and look at the highlight real goals because that's what's going to be posted on Instagram and that's what's yeah. going to be on Snapchat and Twitter. But watch hockey and say, you know, analyze it a little bit, right? Who do I play like, right? Yeah. If you're a six four young defenseman playing for Honeybaked and you're modeling your game after Sam Gerrard, who's five six on the Colorado Avalanche, right? That that may not be who you want to model your game after, right? Right. No, I think. I think finding like an example of someone, it's like almost like a mentor, like a far away, you know, a distant mentor, but you can learn so much just from watching yeah. someone. The amount of things you could pick up just by watching, you know, clips of someone is insane. Like how they do certain little things that you can apply. Cause yes. it's not also, it's not just on ice stuff where you can get better. Vince went over this too. Like it's, it's about um, like imagining it at the same time, right? You can do a lot of mental work to see how you're going to make these moves and then your mind and body are connected. So it's yep. like, once you can see it in your brain, you can feel it when you actually do it. Yeah. And shout out Sam Girard. He's not five, six. He's actually five, 10. I Did you just it Google it. Yeah. <laughs> just Googled it. So I in give case him he cr- listens in case he listens. Yeah. I don't want to give him a bad rep. He's an incredible defenseman. Right. Yeah. Right. Alrighty. So should um, we get off the hockey talk here and we'll jump into a little fun. So on this podcast, we don't only just talk about hockey. We, we, uh, we have a lot of other things going on in our lives. We yes. do a lot of other things outside of this. Fletcher goes to Orange Theory at 5 a.m. every morning. Wow. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just the, the, got to stay in shape these days. You, you got to stay in no, shape. No, I'm not, I'm not hating. No, I'm just, no, I'm, no. Just, I'm just stating it. No, so it's we, good do for- a, we do a lot of other things outside of hockey-related stuff. Um, so one thing I want to bring up, as it is the new year, what what is something that you want to accomplish in the year of 2023? Anything God. that you have thought of that is like I want to go for this. I would say this is going to sound this may may not be expected by some, right? But I want I want to read more. I love reading. Right? I Dude, read you a, read like 5 hours a day. 
Okay, I I, I I read maybe over a little hour, a little over an hour okay. a day. But okay. I love I love reading, and I have it gave me something to do on the bus on road trips in college. Right, it made me a better student. Right, you become yeah. If you can fly through a mystery book, you can fly through a chapter in a textbook much easier. Right. Do you, um, did you look at textbooks? Did you like? Were you able to like go through them and read them? It depends on the class, right? I think a lot of the classes, at least my classes, were kind of like you would. That you do the lecture and then the textbook was like supplementary. So like you're kind of right. get, getting it on the side. Um, yeah, that's how I was too. I could never go through and like read the textbook on its own and like pick up information. It would have to be from the lecture or Google. Yeah. So I would say, I would say reading, reading more. I'd love to, love to play my guitar more. I've been trying that for years. I got a guitar here. So I go right over there, but I'd love YouTube to less you won't bust it out and give us a song this is what we should do this is what we should do not today but in like a month or two you have to come on the cast and play a song That's it, a de- like, deal. like 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 a 30 second excerpt of a song that you learned i'm all for that I, that right. is right That's up accountability. my alley That's accountability right That there. is right up my alley but i i kind of have a bone to pick with new years here Ooh. and i i want to hear your resolution but i'll get your opinion okay. on this Okay. I'll get your opinion on this and then your resolutions too. Okay. Okay. Everybody on social media is running to go post a picture of them at this giant party with these balloons and the bottle service and the, my, all my friends love me. I'm at the club. Three, two, one. Hooray. Over. I'm sorry. I think that that is ridiculous. I I would agree. I I especially think going to clubs is a waste of money. It's yes. awfully expensive for you to stand in a circle with your friends because you can't move because you're elbow to elbow in this tight ass room. Yeah. So and you can't even hear the people talking next to you. So yeah. you're literally screaming in each other's ears the whole time. Um. So no, I completely agree. Um. I think the. I, I think like the, the, you know, the small gatherings with your friends that yes. you're close friends and stuff that that's where it's really at. I think yeah. that's when you have the most fun. I remember in college, so quick story. So when we went into COVID year, yeah. we, we made a rule on our team that we couldn't go to the bars because we were getting tested three times a week because we were still playing games Yeah, that's right. and we were getting tested three times a week. So we, we made this rule that we can't go to the bars because I mean, that's where you meet a lot of different other people. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. were only allowed to have our house parties. And those were some of the most fun nights. Like we still talk about those nights, like getting just the guys together and like whatever girlfriends or something would come. Yeah. And like having those late nights together, like out on our, out in the garages and stuff, singing and whatever, yeah, messing oh, around yeah. versus the ones at the bars. Like yeah. those ones by far are way more memorable than the ones at the bar. Yeah. I would say I, I would this I would argue the same, right? Like, but I just think the the ridiculousness behind the social media post on New Year's three, two, one, boom, the ball drops and nothing. Oh, changes. let's take another one. I didn't like the lighting. Oh, yes. I didn't like my face. <laughs> and, and it's not it's just ridiculous. it's not just girls, right? It's guys too. It's right. Not, right. Whatever happened like I'm sorry. Whatever happened to just enjoy the moment. Let's put the phone away. Let's have a great right. time. Tell me about it later. Tell me about. Call me. Actually, call, call me. me on. The, I know that that is a wild request. It's but tough. Call, it's call tough. me on the phone and tell me how it is. I don't need to see you posting the picture uh, with the filter to prove a lot it's of me. filters. A lot. You got you got the spray tan, and then you got the filter on top of the spray tan. You yeah. got a double filter on you. I, I don't need the double filter post on January 1st. Save it. Save it for March. Oh, yeah. And then everyone's been posting those like 2020 uh, two recaps on Instagram, too. I mean, I made one uh-huh. for TikTok just because like I was trying to be trendy. But yeah. um, <laughs> you got to stay with the trend for, sure, the, for, sure. the, for the hockey aid. But um, and everyone it's just like highlights of like their they don't sh- there's no struggle or anything their lives are perfect you know what that's almost as ridiculous as now i would i'm gonna i got new year's at ranked three we got airports so they're gonna be in there too in the top oh yeah most outrageous things but that that 20 that 22 recap post yeah. is almost as bad as the spotify 2022 oh 
wrap up. That well, is what are those? No one cares about your songs that you like. You know what? Like maybe I care about the number one song because I may adopt that one, right? I may listen to it, right? Jack loves whatever. Right. I may listen to that. But do I care what your sixth ranked listen to on Spotify is for the year? I no. 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 Also, also a thing about the Spotify rap is people post like how many minutes they listen to are they like are they bra- is that a brag that I, I, is that like a humble brag that like oh i listened to more minutes than you did yeah i, I don't know because and it's a little worrisome because if you're not traveling and you're not in the car or you're not cleaning right right where are you listening to music while you're studying i that's not going to be an efficient tactic at least in my no. opinion I do not know how people do that. Listen no. to music and study and stuff. I got to be dialed in one one thought at a time. Yeah, well, can't you can't be- you can't multitask as much as people wish they could multitask. My coach used to say, "Oh, this is oh, this is a great quote." <laughs> this guy's got quotes, man. This, this like guy this had legendary guy. quotes. <laughs> he used to say, "You can't walk and chew bubble gum at the same time." Right? Like, well, like he, you would hope that you could, right? Right. But if I was on the ice, right. And I'm trying to stick handle it and pass it at the same time, or I'm trying to point guys out, but I'm not covering my own guy. He's yeah. to worry about one thing at a time. Right. right? We want to see if we can walk and chew bubble gum, but sometimes we can't. Now it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And maybe it's only funny for me because I'm I'm reliving it. <laughs> right. But this is what I'm saying. It's like right? a random quote that it's he ra- said one day. <laughs> it's a ra- <laughs> you know what? I love it. So all the listeners that may or what is this guy saying? I think it's a good quote. I, I agree. It's tough to chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. It's tough. I agree. <laughs> I love it. All right. So it. I'll get into it. So I'm going to give my resolution. It's not even a resolution. It's just, I like, I think, feel like setting goals helps me get stuff done because I like if that. I don't, I seem to be able to get off track. I like so that. the one me and Fletcher have talked about this before today, but he doesn't know what I'm going to say because we haven't talked about it in a while, but I think for the year of 2023, I want to do a triathlon. I like that a lot. I think that's a good way of being able to f- shift my athletic like mode because not playing hockey now, it can be tough to get up and go to the gym without having a purpose or a goal. Yeah. Like when you were in hockey, right? It's super easy. Like your goal is to, you know, you whatever, you, your, whatever your purpose is, like get to college or get drafted in the NHL. So you have yeah. like that purpose now. I mean, what does my engineer, my engineering job doesn't require me to go and run up a telephone pole to <laughs> fix something. So it's like I I sit, could sit at a desk all day, and I'm still going to be the same. So my yeah. athletic goal for 2023 is to compete in a triathlon. I'm thinking probably around because I live in Utah now, so mm-hmm. Vegas and all Vegas and like Arizona aren't that far from me, and it gets yeah. warm there a little bit earlier. So I'm thinking around the the April. April time frame train for like three months starting in February. I, That's my goal. Yeah, I don't even I'm have, all, a, I don't even wait. I don't even have a bike, but I I'm going to do a triathlon. I'm less so worried about, I, I support you hundred percent. I always will. I'm less so worried about the bike. I'm more so worried about where are you going to train in the pool? Well, we got like at my gym, we got like one of those little lap pools. That's kind of my, that's kind of my goal right now is just, that or that's kind it of my works. plan it works but we also have the olympic training centers here too so i'm thinking i might be able to find a bigger pool are you like like they say in jaws i think we're gonna need a bigger pool yeah, we're, gonna, I, we're, bigger gonna, we're gonna need something here because i don't think that little lap pool is gonna do it and i'm also worried about the swimming just in general yeah like i could go man down like get a cramp and i'm just now out in the middle of a lake i got bad ears so i'm gonna i'm gonna struggle with that to begin with you <laughs> I'm you gonna, got bad ears i'm gonna get like swimmer's ear mid swim or something an infection dude, dude have you ever had vertigo i got vertigo from going i think this is how it happened going too deep in the pool one Ugh. time oh my god probably the worst thing ever you can't even stand up without like falling over and oh. like you're sick to your stomach oh this is how it doesn't sound good. I do want to say, I do want to go circle back to something. We were talking okay. about some some things that irritate us a little bit. And I started doing a little ranking, right? And I yeah, had the Spotify. Yeah. I had the Spotify at number one. I had the, I like the rankings. The, like, the, the, the New like Year's the, the New Year's post around three and sitting yeah. at number two. I said, I said airports. Yeah. I said airports. And it's Christmas time, right? Post Christmas, post Hanukkah. We we're coming off New Year's, a lot of traveling going on. And in my last little trip, 
mm-hmm. boy, I experienced some some wild <laughs> events. F- foul behavior. Foul. It's scary. It's, 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 it's scary. It's not appropriate. It is not appropriate the way people are acting in the airport. What what were you dealing with? Now I got a the, couple. There's a, there, there's a there's a there's a there's a comedian, Sebastian Maniscalco, is very famous Legend, comedian. He's so funny. My favorite comedian of all. And time. he he said something. I don't remember what the what the exact quote was, but he said something like these are the people that we're going to trial with if we're ever like convicted of something and this is the jury we are in big trouble that's what he said oh yeah oh yeah you're done and, you're you're done and the guy sitting next to me this is on a we're delayed three hours right we're already on the plane and we're delayed three hours this is an issue the guy sitting next to me whips out a full-blown pepperoni and garlic pizza i'm not talking a personal pizza i'm talking a full 18 inch pizza he flops Wait. open that thing so when you say garlic, was it like a garlic sauce or was it no, like garlic on it? Like pepperoni slices and garlic slices on the pizza. Wait, there was garlic? Yes. There was like garlic slices? On yes. It? Yeah. Dude, I that yeah. is illegal. You cannot have that on an airplane. No. Stick to the protein bar or like the little turkey wrap that's like this big that you right. could buy for $45 at the shop. It's but great, It's a great deal. <laughs> that pizza was probably like 100 uh, it, it, but do not bring the tuna sandwich clam chowder pepperoni pizza onto the airplane. Did, so so was his box. So you know how the box flips open. Did he yeah. flip that? Did he flip that box onto your? He could have easily flipped that onto your um, tray table. Now and was, now you guys are sharing. Now you guys are sharing a pizza. <laughs> there was there was no one in the middle, so he could have gone with oh. the he could have gone with the side flip. Would you have been pissed if he flipped that side right into the middle seat? Now, I think right, if you're on a plane and there's no middle seat, this is an opportunity as an athlete slash competitor. You got to get you got to gain that space first. So I put my legs right through. No, that. You did. I put my legs through that little, you know, where that guy's legs yeah, would be yeah. the middle guy's legs. Yeah. So that's my oh. that's my space now. I thought you meant you put your legs like no, on the seat. No, the no, thing. no, now no, you no, got no. your toes. Now you got your toes in this pepperoni pizza. <laughs> Would that, but, but at looking at it, would that have been my fault? I don't, he's got the pizza on the plane. I don't know. The feet up might be ju- just as bad. I see this often when people have their own row, they feel like they take the liberty to make it their bed. And I really, come on, you're 40 years old. What are you spreading out across three seats? For? And the poor, you know what the worst part is, is nobody or for the majority, right? The, right. Your legs are going into the aisle now, and now you've turned that into your own bed. And the poor flight attendants are trying to—they're trying to do the cart, and, right. and you got you got noise canceling headphones in that. Yeah, you, the plane the plane could right. be go the plane could be going down, and you have no idea. And <laughs> you're in a comfortable flight, at least you're comfortable, right? And the poor flight attendants c- kind of touching the legs, like, "Hey, uh, excuse me, like, excuse me, can I get through?" And you're out like a light. I think that that's an uncomfortable position, but you're you know right. what and, I do. You know what I do is as a flight attendant, if I'm, ha- if I have that cart and they're laying down in their toes or I, I give it a little, I give it a little jam right was, into the toes, <laughs> right into the toes. I give them a cross check right into the toes. I was going to say, I was going to say you could, you could kind of gain, like I talked about gaining your space, right? A competitor. You could, yeah. could kind of, that, that's your space flight attendant. Take that thing. That hundred percent. I, there's been multiple times where a flight attendant, cause I like sitting in the aisle. Cause like I got long legs and stuff. Yeah. And the amount of times like a, a flight attendant is like wrecked my toe or knee. Yep. They, they, I don't blame them though. If you're doing that, you know, three flights a day. Yeah. I can't even imagine the creatures they see in a day. Oh, it's oh gotta my. be absurd. Now, now, not just creatures and humans. What about, what about oh, creatures and dog animals? We'll call it animals on the plane. Mainly dogs. I have seen a few cats too, but I, I, when we were kids, right, this really wasn't a problem, right? No. You, everyone, if they had a dog, if there was a Shih Tzu sized dog, it was in a little bag. No problem. Yeah. Didn't make a sound. If it was bigger than that, it's under the plane. You don't even see the thing. Yep. Nowadays, it's like a petting zoo out there. You got dogs on no leashes. They're walking down like the moving walkway. It's a free for all. It's practically a dog park. Well, it, one, it's a dog park, and two, right? The 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 owner of the dog, I think, kind of takes on the persona of the dog. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And I got you got some owner, right? If you're if you're bringing your dog onto an airplane. You need to know that people are going to try to pet it. I think that that's just a given. 
Right. So if I reach down, you pet dogs in public. I don't pet dogs in public. I think it depends on the how. What is my proximity to the dog? I'm not going out of my way. You don't walk across the street to, to pet go a dog. pet the dog. But if <laughs> if this dog and I are potentially in line for the airplane, you're gonna pet and it. He's, he's right next to me. I may I may reach down if he starts sniffing my leg. I, I got a problem with that. Flash. You're, you're I, telling me you're I mean, telling me no, if, I don't touch friend dogs. I you're telling me if the dog is sniffing your leg, you're not acknowledging him. I look down and I move my leg away from him because I don't want him sniffing my leg. That's what happens. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. But don't bring him on. Anyway, don't bring him on the plane. If you Unless need, you need it, and if right? You, if you need it, I'm all for it. If you, if you service dog, a great, let the dog do right. a service. I'm all for it. Got the service badge, but they're also selling these service badges on Amazon. So Dude, I don't you get it dirt cheap, dirt cheap. We're going to need a dog police man on this plane checking the service badges. I think right, I, I think it's getting out of control no. with the dogs. I don't need the Cocker Spaniel sitting in 13A getting a puppuccino. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, they actually serve those on Delta now for dogs, puppuccinos. They're free. They're free. We're, I mean, I'm dog friendly. I, I hope the dog, pod, the dog plane podcast, those people who are hosting their yeah. podcast about dog lovers on planes who want to have a dog pilot maybe. I don't know. <laughs> they're probably <laughs> chirping us right now. Oh, they're heavy. Like, they're like these guys hate dogs. I'm. I want the dog to fly the plane, and it right. doesn't have to go through security. <laughs> she, the dog's got TSA pre-check. The dog got. The, the dog well, just bypasses every no issue. It can do. It could dump on the plane, and people are like, "Oh my god, the dog's so cute." I'm like I've you- seen, <laughs> I've seen now multiple times with, with. It's actually with cats though, which I think I even have more of a problem with on planes. Yeah. I just don't like cats. No, yeah. no offense to cat lovers, but I just don't like them. Yeah. Um, they, they're scary. They're just I, scary. I have two cats, and, but we'll forget about that. Okay, that's fine. You'll, you'll get over it. But I've seen now two cats escape on planes. They've that been is, running around the plane. Two of them. I would feel bad if the person next to me is allergic. Like, if the person next to me is allergic to cats and I bring a cat on the plane, I've ruined their flight. Oh, 100%. You ruin their whole. You possibly ruin their whole week because now they got a stuffy face for the rest of the week because you wanted to bring your cat on the plane. It's fair. It's, it's totally fair. Now what? <laughs> now we'll end the we'll end the airplane talk. I don't care how tough you are. Any not you necessarily. Any person that's listening, right? There's always a degree of fear when you get on the plane, and I want to know, Jack Nichols, what is your biggest airplane Ooh, fear? All right. So, I mean, airplanes are just scary in general. It's a tube. It's literally a tube floating in the air. It's fair. I, I tried to, so real quick, I'll give you a quick little story. For senior design, we have to, we get a project. Ours, we, we were in a, we were building an RC aircraft airplane. I like that. For a, for a competition. It was extremely hard with only five of us. And we didn't even get the thing off the ground. We had a whole year to do it. And we didn't get an airplane <laughs> off the ground, let alone these Big ass aircrafts that are up in the air every day, nonstop. Yeah. So the one thing though that scares me is on the landing. Every single time I feel like the brakes are not going to engage correctly. And now we're zooming back up into the air because we can't stop. Yes. And once and so how my thing is, how are we going to stop? We got to come down eventually. It's true. So where, where are we coming down? Cause I need to know. Well, I, I'm always worried, right? You talk about the brake system, right? They kind of go, yeah. they start down. Obviously, you're on the ground. You get into the air and they come up, right? right. I'm worried they're getting stuck, right? Know. That little, right. Th- 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 like, neck, you kind of get surprised, right? When you're landing, they, they kind of put them down kind of high, mm-hmm. right? Maybe that's yeah, like, they, a, do. they put them down kind of high and that noise is a loud noise, like a do, 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 like that. It's kind of like a loud noise like that. Right, right. If you, especially and, if you're under, right, and if right you're above not, it. If you're not expecting that, it, it sounds like a pelican has just gone right into the right engine and you're going into the Pacific. That actually might be one of the scariest things, though, like a bird going into the engine. They, that they, that might be scarier. Maybe my New Year's resolution would be creating some sort of invention to prevent birds from going into the engine. That would be quite the invention. I, I think you can do it. I don't know how effective it would be in terms of flying, but I think uh, you could do it. <laughs> it wouldn't be it would, like it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world at all. No, it would actually be a solid invention. Whoever whoever does that eventually, you know what? So, it won't, you know what? It won't be as solid as though. What episode one of the what? No One Told Me 
podcast. Let's go. I just want to let the listeners know that this is our fourth try on episode one due to video and audio issues, but I think we have a first successful podcast here. So I think we should wrap it up here with the no one told me it's a hockey podcast with myself, Jack, and my boy Fletcher over there. We're going to try to do this once a week, get them out, help, hopefully help as many youth, youth junior hockey players as we can give out some knowledge, give out a couple laughs. So you have anything else to say? I would say thank you very much for tuning in today. Check out Jack on TikTok at hockey aid, and we will talk to you guys soon. Sounds good. I'll talk to you later, Fletcher. Right on. See you later. See you, buddy.